Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the inaugural webinar hosted by the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue University and the Institute of World Politics, a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs in Washington, D.C. I'm Jim Robbins, Dean of Academics at IWP. Our topic this episode is Iran Today Between Domestic Unrest and the Race for the Bomb. We will be discussing the technical aspects of nuclear power and nuclear weapons, Iran's nuclear aspirations, the nature of the regime in Tehran, and the regime's domestic critics and opponents. Our panel today is Professor Lefteri Tsukalis, a senior research fellow at the Kroc Institute, Gabriel Narana, executive director of Polaris National Security, and Eli Kohanim, an advisory council member for the Kroc Institute and senior fellow with the Independent Women's Forum. Thank you for joining us here today. We'll start with Terry, who, in addition to his affiliation with the Kroc Institute, is professor and former head of the School of Nuclear Engineering at Purdue University and a noted nuclear expert. He is the author of Fuzzy Logic, Applications in Artificial Intelligence, Big Data, and Machine Learning, and the soon-to-be-released Who is Afraid of Artificial Intelligence? Short answer to that, just about everybody, but that'll be a good book. Including me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Tsikalis will discuss the technical aspects of nuclear power and weapons and how nuclear programs can be used for peaceful purposes or pose a threat. Lefteri, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dean Robbins. So I'm going to, I'm afraid of, of PowerPoint here. So not just artificial intelligence, uh, but I'm going to try to replicate our previously run experiment of sharing, sorry, uh, sharing a PowerPoint uh, share content oh, right here. I think. Can you see what I have here on the screen? I'll put it in uh, full mode. Is that OK? Looks good. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the question about Iran's nuclear program and, uh, you know, what is uh, that they want to do and what they have is basically breaking going down to two different questions. Is there a race for the bomb? And in my considerate opinion, yes, there is a race. And the second question is, where is Iran at this race? So again, I'm using uh, estimates from technology, from analogies, not, you know, secret or private uh, or confidential information and data here. Uh, based on what I know and what I have seen over several years now, decades, couple of decades, uh, Iran is probably at the state uh, of affairs where they are examining advanced designs, not just the simple bombs, which I will introduce in a moment. Uh, it seems that they want to have more control of their own and develop their own nuclear supply chain and also uh, protect, for the most part, and control their nuclear workforce. So we will see what these things mean in a moment. But let's go back and have a, uh, you know, bombs, atomic bombs 101 crash course. And I did promise Zach to be succinct. So this is as succinct as I can make it. Um, to begin with, in 1945, the world you know, woke up to a new era, the atomic age. I guess we're still in, and now we see a lot more because of whatever happens in the disturbance of the balance of power in uh, Central Europe. We see a lot more interest in, in this kind of devices. But the devices uh, were two, and they kind of make the uh, archetypal bombs. The little boy, which is uh, two parts of uranium-235, when they come together here on the left, when they come together, uh, then we have a critical mass uh, and a chain reaction ensues. And if it can be contained for, you know, times in the order of uh, nanosecond, millisecond, no longer than that, then we can have uh, enough uh, of a chain reaction uh, to produce a, you know, thousands of tons, 10, 15 thousand tons equivalent of uh, TNT explosion. And the, the main thing is here to observe that we have two critical materials, uranium-235, these are fissile materials, 
and plutonium-239, they, they are very similar in, in terms of functionality, and, and one of them was uranium-235, the fissile material, the plutonium-239, the other fissile material. Fissile material means it can participate in a chain reaction, and sometimes uh, the distinction is made with fertile material, which is where we could get fissile material through some sort of uh, uh, esoteric, but actually well understood processes. The advanced designs, these are the hydrogen bombs. All hydrogen bombs require some kind of plutonium based, plutonium 239 is really the golden uh, of the two uh, fissile materials. Uh, and these designs are, you know, they were they're known. So we're talking about old stuff, right? 1945, 1951, the Teller, Ulam Teller design. Uh, but here, the atomic bomb, the plutonium bomb, acts as a trigger. It's the trigger, but you need to have some lithium deuteride or some other stuff. So now we're talking about millions of tons of uh, equivalent TNT. And the important thing is that these advanced designs can be uh, turned into warheads. They're simpler, they're about this big, uh, and they can, they're easier to weaponize and put on missiles. So, you know, this is a another technical side. I won't touch upon the missile part, but, you know, missiles are uh, the uh, main, uh, I mean, the principal tools for delivering these this warheads. And once you go to advanced designs, you can really, the other stuff is too bulky. You cannot make, uh, you know, you cannot put them on missiles. But here you're talking about, you know, a few hundred uh, uh, kilograms. So now, um, just to illustrate what supply chain and workforce means, I will I give it as an example. There were six technologies needed for the FATMAN. The FATMAN is the plutonium bomb. Uh, it's an implosion device. You need much less plutonium uh, than uranium, uranium for critical mass. So it's the pathway to go and to get started. But plutonium, for plutonium, you need to have a reactor. You need to have a, you know, uh, in a reactor, you need to have uh, the technology to transform, uh, you know, the uh, these esoteric nuclear processes into fissile material. So one area, one technology is getting that fissile material. And again, as we said, we need the reactor. There's another thing that has to do with the implosion design, with how you can get uh, this uh, shock wave to compress a small plutonium, what, you know, I think of it as a ball this big, uh, to compress it and to give, uh, to release this extraordinary, to have this exothermic reaction, extraordinary energy. Another area of technology is uh, to have initiators, uh, plutonium, polonium-210 isotopes of beryllium. These are just to get started with the neutrons these are emitting neutrons, so you need to have the technology to have them in the right place at the right time for the right purpose. You need a lot of explosives, conventional explosives and detonators that have to be synchronized, and that's a difficult problem. And I think this is something that nowadays is a little easier with power electronics. You need to have reflectors to control the economy and make sure of neutrons, make sure they don't run out. And you need to have the case. The casing is important. It's not just a box uh, that surrounds. It has functionality. So the point I bring this up is because one strategy for developing weapons is to divide and conquer. You know, in that, you know, we think, and the national, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is has national frames of responsibility for weapons. But it is possible for nations to share this technology and and to collaborate. So, you know, I do the fissile material, somebody else does the implosion design, the initiators and so forth. It's not, I'm not suggesting this, you know, again, you know, we're looking at it from the point of view of the world as we find it, uh, you know, and, and uh, this is really what has happened. Some countries have done this. Uh, so, that's the point I, I I want to 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 bring that uh, nuclear workforce and supply chain, because of the collapse of the Soviet Union after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early nineties, a lot of uh, technicians, engineers, but also devices and materials start floating around, uh, and and it seems that outside of the non proliferation treaty, it seems that. Uh, you know, countries like uh, Iran, 
collaborated with Pakistan, with uh, North Korea, maybe there are other, you know, companies in this, uh, everybody has heard of the AQCAN network. Uh, so there is a kind of, uh, you know, nuclear workforce and supply chain that seems to have uh, developed outside the non-proliferation treaty, even though some of these countries have created, uh, you know, have signed the treaty, Iran has signed the treaty, but not additional protocol. Um, but nonetheless, we have now new means, and because there is a new uh, or re revamped interest in nuclear, uh, you know, weaponry around the world, uh, there are, it's all, it's not all hopeless. There are ways to observe, to create uh, signatures and observables. And uh, the technical means need to be uh, advanced. They are becoming, you know, better by the day so that diplomacy can start and, and decisions can be made about how to manage a, a situation where uh, if left uh, unchecked, it could be perilous for the future of the world. So, uh, to I promised Jacques again that I will be succinct. So I come to the uh, you know the end here. I just want to say that uh, Iran likely seeks acceptance of its nuclear power status as fait accompli. Uh, so they do have something. They do have things. Uh, they didn't get it all by themselves. They collaborated with other, uh, you know, agents, other states in this uh, post-Soviet Union situation that I briefly described. Uh, so they may be okay and they may seek a you don't tell, I don't know type of policy, something similar to what happens with other countries. Uh, now, the interesting thing is they may be seeking more control over their own supply chain so they don't want to depend on north korean for plutonium for example you know they want to be able to have their own and also uh control and protection of their own workforce so the question then is this may be the worst case scenario let's say and for planning purposes very often we uh you know start or we focus on the worst case scenario. I hope this none of this is uh, the case, but if it is the case, then it may be possible for Iran to be inducted to through some formula, maybe an unwritten agreement, as the New York Times intimated a few days ago, uh, you know, to but to be inducted to the level of responsibilities that emanate from the custodianship of nuclear weapons. Because nuclear weapons are not just things you put in the shelf. They need constant care and maintenance, and foremost, they need to really uh, be, uh, in a way, they need to they, they compare a separate status where the work of uh, diplomacy becomes quite different. You know, they have different responsibilities. On the other hand, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, bridge between technology and diplomacy here uh, uh, means that we have more technology to uh, again, because of digitization, of which Purdue is a leading uh, institution, I have to make this uh, commercial, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, bid here. Uh, but basically, digital signatures and observables can be sold, can be learned, can be cataloged, can be used with the help of some AI and machine learning to understand and to monitor so that uh, it's not just uh, goodwill and, uh, you know, uh, words uh, because states as we know and we have this uh, from the, the, the history states can be using paradoxical strategies they're not always you know hold, held up to a standard of truth that we assume uh, you know when we do scientific uh, work so this is uh, the technical sort of summary from my uh, perspective and uh, I'll turn it to uh, uh, Dean Robbins at this point. Oh, thank you, uh, Lefteria. That was very informative. Uh, look forward to asking you some questions when we get to the Q&A. Thank you, Jim. Uh, next up is Gabriel, Gabriel Naranja, the Executive Director of Polaris National Security and a Policy Fellow at GINSA, the Jewish Institute for National Security of America. He previously served in the State Department as the Special Advisor for Iran under Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. And before that, worked in the U.S. Senate for four years, including as the Special Assistant to the Senate Armed Services Committee 
under Chairman John McCain. Gabe will be discussing Tehran's nuclear ambitions and the implications for regional peace and stability. Gabe. Thank you for having me, Dean Robbins and, and, uh, and Purdue Center, and, and good to be with you, Ellie and, and uh, Professor. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, how Iran's nuclear program has evolved in the last 20 years, um, what their ambitions exactly are, and, and, and where we are going today. Uh, so 20 years ago, um, Iran, a, a sort of opposition group unveiled that Iran had a secret nuclear program, um, which has been called the Ahmad Plan, um, to clandestinely build a nuclear uh, weapons program uh, using the uranium uh, pathway that uh, Dr. Lefteri has talked about. Now, this was right as the United States was uh, about to invade Iraq. Um, so as that happened, Iranians um, got pretty terrified and, and said, OK, we're actually going to mothball this whole program for a little while. It's too dangerous. We do not want to be the target of U.S. Uh, retribution. Um, and so they dismantled it, but they kept the materials and they kept the planning and all the technical documents actually in a warehouse um, in Tehran um, that would later become uncovered by Israeli uh, operatives. Now, in 2006, Iran uh, felt that it had a little bit more space. The United States was dragged down in, in Iraq, which was, the Iranians were actually helping um, make that a, a more ask for, for Americans. And they started building their nuclear program, um, starting to do enrichment, building centrifuges, um, creating nuclear facilities under mountains in certain cases. And that prompted uh, the United Nations to pass a series of six Security Council resolutions against Iran, imposing all sorts of penalties and restrictions on Iran, including making uh, a full prohibition under international law for Iran to be doing any of this enrichment, as well as for any nation to assist Iran with any of its enrichment, reprocessing, weaponization activities that are necessary to create that bomb. Um, starting about 2010, uh, the, international, the United States really also started putting really punishing economic sanctions on Iran for its nuclear program. Uh, and that lasted uh, five years until ultimately um, the Russia, China, uh, United Kingdom, France, Germany, and the United States negotiated the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. What that did was it took, Iran at that point was enriching uranium to about 20% purity. Um, now, 20% purity is actually about 90% of the enrichment work you need to do to get that weapons grade, usually about 90% enriched uranium, where you can actually then, that's the critical mass um, where it, where you can actually have an exploding weapon. But that 20%, it's not a linear conversion. It's actually sort of a logarithmic um, scale. And once you get up to 20%, you're pretty close uh, to a nuclear weapon. Um, the JCPOA um, restricted Iran to 3.67% enrichment um, and about 200 kilograms of, of that material. Now, that was a really actually important concession to Iran because previously, um, Iran did not have any international legitimate right to enrich uranium. Um, there's lots of countries which sign uh, sort of what's called the gold standard, where you can have civil nuclear program without actually enriching uranium. For example, the United Arab Emirates um, imports all of its fuel for its nuclear program from the IAEA's fuel bank uh, in Kazakhstan. Um, there's lots of other nations who don't need to do domestic enrichment themselves. They can get it from other countries and that allows you to have nuclear power. Um, the reason Iran wants to have domestic enrichment is because it wants to be able to scale it up to exceed the levels of enrichment that it would use for a just purely civilian nuclear program. And starting in 2019, uh, Iran started doing just that. Um, oh, starting in, March, in May 2019, and then for a full year, it slowly started escalating its nuclear program breaking its JCPOA commitments. Um, and over the last now five years, um, Iran has amassed huge amounts of very highly enriched uranium. It's gotten to 60% um, uranium. It has over 114 kilograms of, of that material, um, and then hundreds of kilograms at lower levels. That means that today, according to uh, intelligence estimates, Iran is about 10 days away from having the fissile material for a nuclear weapon. Um, 
And they would probably have the ability right now to enrich about enough uh, uranium for about six to eight bombs if they chose to do so. Now, it's also important to know there's, there's two separate sort of timelines here. There's the fissile material enrichment timeline, which is getting all that material ready to be able to be weaponized. And then there's the actual creation of a physical weapon, that firing mechanism, um, encasing it, um, the detonation devices, all of that. That's an entirely separate technical timeline. For many years, until really just a few months ago, the international community, United States, Israel, all sort of said, we don't see indications that Iran is pursuing that weaponization activity. That changed um, the, in, in about March. Um, there was a report um, from General Milley to Congress where he basically said uh, that if you read between the lines, you started realizing that Iran was now only several months away from that weaponization time. Um, so you have to have those two components, the fissile material and the weaponization to create a weapon that's actually deliverable. Um, sorry, that's, that's explodable. Um, you then have to have the delivery mechanism, which in Iran's case is usually ideally a ballistic missile. And you pair that nuclear device to that ballistic missile, you're able to get it to a complete re-entry um, and if it can go far enough, then it could reach Israel, um, reach Europe. They are not currently at the stage where their missiles are able to hit the United States, um, but they are very much intrigued in getting that possibility. So right now we're sort of seeing Iran's nuclear program is fairly unconstrained. Um, it's slowly building up that nuclear material so that it could have a large arsenal. Um, you know, I've always said having one nuclear weapon is a really dangerous thing. If you just have one nuclear weapon and either you fire it and then the other side destroys your program and everything else, or they have a good chance that we can actually use a first strike capability and destroy that one nuclear weapon. What nations want is a second strike capability where if, if they get attacked, they know that they can reciprocate, attack someone else. And that's the, really the only way that you have true national security and guaranteed stability is when you can guarantee to the other side that, that either way, no matter what you do, um, we're able to retaliate and, and destroy the other, the other side. And so that's what Iran is looking for, ultimately the capability of getting to the point where it can have a second strike capability and deter someone like Israel or the United States from actually destroying their nuclear program. Um, the United States and other countries, especially in Europe, obviously do not want that to happen. So in the Trump administration, um, we had the, which I was a member of, um, we had the approach that we wanted to uh, reach a comprehensive, a truly comprehensive program of Iran that permanently prevented Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Uh, the disagreement between the Trump administration and Obama administration is the idea of that permanent mechanism. So the, the JCPOA only prohibited Iran from having um, that 3.67% that uranium enrichment for about 15 years. So eight year, less than eight years from today, Iran would actually be completely free to do every single thing it's doing right now under international law. There would be no sanctions on it, no restrictions, uh, and it would be sort of legitimized to create that nuclear weapon. What the Trump administration sought was something that would permanently close off Iran's nuclear program, permanently dismantle all the infrastructure, um, get rid of the centrifuges development. It, it opened the possibility that Iran could still have nuclear power, just in the same way that the United Arab Emirates has nuclear power and, and several other countries do without this domestic enrichment program of its own. Um, Iran uh, didn't have any interest in that scheme. Um, uh, because really at the, at the core of it, even though Iran often says it wants its nuclear program for power generation or medical research, at the end of the day, those are, that's just regime propaganda. Um, it shows time and time again that it will conduct enrichment activities that have no credible civilian use. There's nothing you can use that for except to build a nuclear weapon. Um, now, the Trump administration's efforts didn't succeed. Um, we didn't get Iran to the negotiating table. Um, they were pretty dug in and didn't want to do anything. Um, the Biden administration has tried really hard to get back to the 2015 JCPOA, um, but they also ultimately failed um, for different reasons, um, mainly that they let up all the economic pressure on Iran up front. 
Um, so the Trump administration imposed really grueling sanctions that uh, deprived the regime of all the revenue it needed um, to carry out its terror programs, its military spending. But also even uh, they were having trouble buying centrifuges, hiring nuclear scientists. They were just running out of money. And the Biden administration sort of relaxed those sanctions because it was trying to dial down the pressure. But as a result, the regime felt that it had um, no need to negotiate anymore, didn't feel that it was under pressure. And so they ultimately threw up sort of fake negotiating uh, tactics at the end of every deal to basically keep asking for more and more. Uh, and ultimately, the United States is now currently of the view that, it, that we're not re-entering or trying to re-enter the JCPOA. Um, the newest initiative, which is being reported now in the press, um, is uh, what they are pretending is sort of a mutual understanding. Um, and that's sort of intended to bypass uh, U.S. law to where normally Congress gets to review any deal. So what would happen in this current deal is that uh, Iran would freeze its nuclear enrichment at that 60% level where it is today. Um, now, it's allowed to actually um, continue enriching there as long as it doesn't build up material. So any material at 60% it has, it needs to down blend down to about 20%. And there's no restriction on how much of uh, that lower enriched uranium it can build. You need that material so that you can build the feedstock to create all the weapons grade material for 90%. So it really just says you can do the lower level stuff, you can you can prepare, but you can't get up to the point where you're getting really close to that uranium becoming weapons grade. Um, now it's important to know that wouldn't change Iran's nuclear breakout timeline at all. So it freezes where it is at about 10 days, but doesn't reduce it. And in exchange, United States would relent on some of its oil sanctions enforcement um, some of its um, confiscation of Iranian uh, oil tankers, um, which is, again, the lifeblood of the regime and its sort of terror program. Um, so this is sort of being negotiated uh, through uh, Omani officials. Officially, Iranians won't meet with U.S. officials usually, uh, and they want someone else to ferry the messages between them. Um, this is sort of a pride thing, but also a leverage thing that they use. Um, and so uh, the Deputy National Security Advisor, Brett McGurk, has been going to Oman recently, um, having these sort of secret meetings um, in hotels where the Omanis pass a message him to the Iranians and then back and forth. Um, and so the Omani foreign minister recently just said that they are very close to some deal like that. That deal is going to face extremely uphill uh, battles in Congress, partly because it would one of the provisions is the United States would release 10, perhaps even tens of billions of dollars of frozen Iranian funds to Iran um, as part of this deal. The issue there is if your goal is to permanently stop Iran's nuclear program or permanently end their pathway to a nuclear weapon, um, that's not really going to help at all because they can just restart at any point um, and you've given up all the leverage to get your comprehensive deal. Um, so that's a little troubling. Um, I know I only have a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll talk really briefly about why is it we don't want Iran to get a nuclear weapon? Um, because I think it's important to ask sort of those rhetorical questions of, you know, North Korea got a nuclear weapon and we don't have nuclear war. China has a nuclear weapon. We don't have nuclear war. Um, actually, I think the best way to look at it is look at exactly what happened in Russia with their nuclear weapons, where they invaded Ukraine. And then they said, oh, if Ukraine takes back that territory that we took, we will call that a territorial uh, a violation of, of now Russian territory, and we will respond to the use of nuclear weapons. That is the definition of nuclear blackmail. It's sort of saying, if you don't do X, or if you do X, we will nuke you. And that is the behavior of a terrorist regime that does those things, where lots of times the Iranians will say, take other people's tankers and, and ships hostage. And they'll say, we'll give them back to you if you release our, our frozen funds here, or we'll give them back to you if you withdraw these forces. Um, so they liked using this hardball diplomacy um, and Iran would use that even further with a nuclear weapon. And the last one is, is simply, if you look at Iran's rhetoric about the United States, about Israel, it's pretty apocalyptic. 
Um, they say things like, we will wipe Israel off the face of the map. Um, Jerusalem will, will be, will, you know, the, fin- the only solution is the final solution, which everyone knows is a reference to Hitler's um, plan to eliminate Jews. Um, now you can argue, okay, this is just, you know, they're, they're yelling, they're making these points. And I would sort of say the greatest mistake that Americans and really people throughout Europe have made throughout history is not believing dictators when they tell us something that they're going to do. When Hitler, again, talked about the final solution or talked about creating living space, um, that's exactly what he tried to do. When the Soviet Union was trying to spread communism, it was right there in their public statements all the time that that's what they were trying to do. And sometimes we just didn't listen. And so I think if you don't listen to Iran when they say we want to wipe Israel off the map or we want to impose the final solution, uh, you only have yourselves to blame uh, in that situation. And so it's been the policy for the last five or six presidents now of both parties that Iran should never be allowed to get a nuclear weapon uh, just because that possibility is so damaging and, and, and potentially destructive. Um, and so there's always the possibility of the U.S. using military force, of Israel using military force to destroy Iran's nuclear program. Um, that's sort of the final recourse. It should always be on the table, but it won't be easy and it won't be simple and it won't be pretty um, when that comes. Um, if that event happens, it's going to be sort of full scale war in the region between Iran and its proxies and Israel. Um, that's a situation the United States wants to avoid, Israel wants to avoid, but at the end of the day, it sort of has to be on the table. Otherwise, Iran will feel that it has no limitation to actually going and just pursuing that nuclear weapon. So happy to talk about more about that in Q&A, but we'll turn it back to you. Dave, thanks. That's uh, frightening. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. It's never just rhetoric. When they say they want to kill you, listen. Our third panelist is Ellie Kohanim, an advisory council member of the Kroc Institute and senior fellow with the Independent Women's Forum. Ellie previously served as U.S. Deputy Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism and was the State Department's first Iranian-born envoy. Ellie received her B.A. in political science from Barnard College and conducted graduate study at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She can be seen on Fox News, Newsmax, and CBN and is a contributor to The Hill, National Review, and Newsweek. Ellie will tell us about the domestic scene in Iran, the nature of the Islamic Republic, and the popular resistance to the Tehran regime. Ellie, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, I just want to start with sharing my deepest thanks to the hosts of this conversation, to Keith Kroc, co-founder of the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy, at Purdue University, which I'm so proud to be a member of the advisory board. Uh, former Undersecretary Kroc is a leader in the cause of freedom and democracy around the world, and so it's just my honor to join you all today in this conversation. My thanks also to the co-hosts of this event, the Institute of World Politics, our moderator, um, the dean, as well my uh, my co-panelists. Um, it's really wonderful to be with you all today. Um, as we all know, the um, the killing of the Kurdish Iranian young woman Mahsa Amini in September at the hands of regime authorities for quote unquote improper hijab set off a national and unified protest movement across Iran, one which I would characterize as a revolutionary movement in that the protesters stated aim has been a call for the end of the Islamic Republic regime's ruling over the Iranian people. In response to this revolutionary and wide-scale protest movement, we've witnessed a brutal crackdown by the regime, which has included blinding of protesters, mass arrests, unlawful detainments, forced confessions, torture, targeting of children and chemical poisoning of girls' schools, intimidation, harassment of family members, sham trials, and executions. In the face of this brutal regime crackdown, it is no wonder that the revolutionary protest movement has evolved from a mass wide scale street protest movement to a more targeted but ongoing movement, which I will detail shortly. But the headline here is as follows. The genie is out of the bottle, is what I argue, and there's nothing that the regime can do to suppress this ongoing revolutionary movement. 
The Iranian people have gone on record. They've demanded death to the regime and death to Khamenei. Now, in contrast to what some regime-affiliated folks will tell you or some Western media outlets have reported, there is nobody on the streets of Iran who has called for reform of the existing government. So again, I want to point that out again. There, no one is asking for reform. They are looking for a downfall of the regime. So the genie is out of the bottle, and the Iranian people have taken bullets to the head and faced mass incarceration to let the regime and the world know that this regime has no, has lost, I would say, uh, mass support in the country if it ever held that support in the first place. We're now nine months into these nationwide protests, and the figures are as follows. An estimate of over 3,500 protests have taken place across the country, including at least 38 protests just last week. To date, Iranian security forces have killed some 628 protesters, including at least 75 minors, and they've arrested over 21,000 people, including, again, thousands of minors. For those who are interested in seeing more detail on the protest movement, um, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, FDD, has an excellent online mapping tool. I really uh, encourage folks to go to FDD's website and take a look for more details. Now, as a result of the Massa Amini protests, which turned into the Zan Zendegi Azadi, or Woman Life Freedom Revolutionary Movement, there are a number of fundamental changes that have taken place in Iranian society, which I would argue are actually impossible for the regime to reverse, no matter how brutal their response, which in fact pose a significant threat to the regime's long-term ability to retain power in Iran. First is the status of women in society and Iranian women's increasing non-compliance with mandatory hijab laws. Photos and videos of unveiled Iranian women and girls are available across social media platforms. Further evidence of this phenomena is the recent headlines coming out of Iran, including one about Iran's police chief uh, threatening government offices that do not deny services to unveiled women. Iranian media last week also published the final version of a new hijab bill prepared by the judiciary and, and the government. Um, an earlier draft, which was revealed just two weeks prior, was strongly criticized by hardliners, which saw it as too lenient. Punishments proposed in the new bill are mainly cash fines, which range from about $10 to, to, 400, to $480 for repeat offenders and deprivation from employment and social media activity for athletes, celebrities, and activists. Perhaps what's most interesting to note is that the bill also includes provisions against anyone, quote unquote, who, um, other than authorities, who confronts citizens on the street or uses violence and threats against unveiled women. Now, this was something we saw routinely in Iran, and apparently they are trying to outlaw this. Hardliners have strongly criticized the bill, stating that the bill would promote unveiling rather than preventing it. What we see here, too, is that the genie is out of the bottle, that Iranian women, having tasted freedom from mandatory hijab, are rightfully refusing to be forced back under the veil. And perhaps even more threatening to the future of the regime is the extent to which young girls and women have participated in the, I should say girls and young women, have participated in the Massa Amini protests. What we witnessed was an entire generation of girls who found their voice during the protests and pushed back at school administrators, shared viral photos of themselves hijab free, and took to the streets to protest. In response, the regime has arrested thousands of children during the protests and against UN convention detained and treated these children as adult prisoners. Also, regime authorities have entered all girls' schools and forced these girls to watch pornographic materials. And finally, Amnesty International has called for an independent investigation and in what it details are chemical attacks at over 100 schools in Iran, which have been targeted since November, some of them more than once. Amnesty says the poisonings appear to be a coordinated campaign to punish schoolgirls for their peaceful participation in the protests. Iran's girls are literally under attack by the regime, but yet again, I would argue the genie is out of the bottle. This entire generation has courageously and boldly stood up against the regime. There is no future in which a regime can retain power against an entire generation. 
In the months since the Massa Amini protests, we also have witnessed strikes by various sectors of the economy, including the important energy sector workers. Just last week, reports came in of businesses shutting down in protests at the damage to Massa Amini's grave by regime forces. The cemetery itself has become a scene of de demonstrations. Iran International reported last Friday dozens of victims' family members held pictures of their loved ones in peaceful po protests, while in a heavy-handed regime response, the regime arrested and transferred about 40 of those protesters to unknown locations, including six mothers of young victims. The picture for the Islamic Republic regime is quite cloudy. Half the population, women, resisting mandatory hijab. The next generation, girls and boys, participated in a protest movement en masse. Ethnic and religious minorities face constant discrimination and harassment, and they've been taking even arms up to protests in response. And we have an overall population that daily deals with corruption, rampant inflation, a worthless currency, mass poverty and misery, while they witness the mullahs and their cronies pocket the country's resources or divert the country's resources to proxy activity to terrorism and the nuclear program. All this has generated unprecedented unity among the Iranian people across gender, class, religion, and ethnicity in an unprecedented resistance to the regime. Now, I want to turn our conversation to the opposition to the regime and the Iranian diaspora today. What we've seen as a result of the woman life freedom movement external to the country is, number one, a more unified opposition to the regime than anything that's existed ever before. Second, greater international support for the Iranian people and their quest for freedom than anything we've experienced ever before. And a more engaged Iranian diaspora in the US and in the EU than we've experienced ever before. In this way, the woman life freedom movement has led to historic achievements already. One question many of us grapple with is what can we predict as a potential regime downfall event? And here I would posit two scenarios, one guaranteed, the other not. The guaranteed scenario is the eventual death of the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei, who's currently 85 years old. We know that he's going to die at some point. And uh, I would pose it that um, that could be a potential regime downfall event. The other scenario is one in which uh, we don't have a guarantee of it happening, but there has been a lot of talk about it. Um, that is the scenario in which the Israelis choose to um, make a strike against Iran's nuclear uh, facility, something that Gabe just mentioned as a possibility in his remarks. And, uh, and, and a strike um, could potentially offer the Iranian people um, the opportunity for a mass protest movement to bring down the regime at a moment when the regime would presumably be distracted in figuring out its own reaction to an Israeli strike. So um, I just wanted to share that as uh, two potential events that all of us should uh, be thinking about. Um, going back to the opposition movement, in the last year, we've seen the opposition figures work together and separately to address uh, and advocate on behalf of the Iranian people and their quest for freedom, whether in testimony at the United Nations, in meetings with heads of states and parliaments, or taking to the airwaves internationally. As a result of these efforts by opposition figures like Iran's exiled crown prince Reza Pahlavi, the journalist Masi Ali Najad, actress Nazanin Bonyadi, activist Hamid Esmalian, and others, we witnessed this year unprecedented international support for the Iranian freedom movement, as well as the mobilization of the Iranian diaspora, whose combined net worth is estimated to reach roughly $2.5 trillion, placing the diaspora's net worth um, as high as the GDP GDPs of countries like Canada and France. Should the Iranian diaspora be further organized and mobilized, there's great potential for this powerful community to continue uh, to influence our respective Western governments. I'd like to conclude my remarks with what I believe ties our conversation back to the beginning of this webinar, which is what I have termed the Islamic Republic of Iran regime's, quote, obsessive anti-Semitism 
which ultimately brings us back to the nuclear file. In my term in office, our administration designated the Iranian regime not only as the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, but also as the world's leading state sponsor of anti-Semitism. And I would argue that designation still holds today. The regime's anti-Semitism motivates every action the regime takes, whether it's their state policy um, to deny the Holocaust ever took place and to host Holocaust cartoon competitions, whether it's their terror proxy activity, which includes funding training, uh, their terror proxies, which the regime hopes will encircle the Jewish state of Israel, namely Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Iranian militias and Syria, to the oppression of the Jewish population whose ancestry in ancient Persia predates the Islamic conquest. The regime's very raison d'etre is the, the quest for a Shiite caliphate across the Middle East, which holds no room for a Jewish state in its vision. The Islamic Republic's supreme leader himself has shared a 14-point plan for the destruction and elimination of Israel. With the regime's recent unveiling of a supposed hypersonic missile, their growing military presence in Syria, the continued funding and training of their terror proxies targeting Israel, including most recently from within the West Bank, and most significantly, the regime's relentless pursuit of a nuclear bomb. It would behoove US and European governments to take seriously and again, my colleague, former colleague Gabe Narona just mentioned this, it takes us Really, uh, you know, I don't see how world leaders can ignore the Ayatollah Khamenei's stated goal of committing genocide against the Jewish people in his hopes to eliminate the Jewish state of Israel. And uh, with that, I thank you all and look forward to questions. Thank you, Ali. That also, you know, frightening. When they say these things, be sure to listen because they mean them. Well, thanks to our three panelists, and uh, now we'll move into a discussion period. If you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A function at the bottom right hand of your screen. Uh, we have one from Len I'd like to throw out. Maybe this could go to Gabe. Uh, as things stand today, can Iran be prevented from attaining a nuclear weapon? You know, it's interesting that even though Iran has had a nuclear program for in various iterations for 20 years, it still doesn't have one. Um, one, I think there's one anecdote that I like to use, which explains a little bit why. When in 2019, Iran started ex escalating its nuclear program, every time they did so, they would invite dozens of reporters to come to the, the new announcement that they were going to expand enrichment. Um, they would take photos, really hype it up. It wasn't Part of it was, yes, they were they were building the nuclear program, but part of it was they really wanted to frighten um, the American and European publics. And all of it was intended as sort of this, again, this extortion scheme of how do you get sanctions relief? How do you get economic mobility so you can um, advance your terror funding? At the end of the day, the nuclear bomb is basically just a means as to an ends of them carrying out their foreign policy. And so as long as there's this deterrent that says, hey, if the United States or Israel have as a firm dedicated policy that they won't allow Iran to get a nuclear weapon, Iran doesn't want to risk its own stability. So it's always gonna be a cost benefit analysis to them. Do they think it's worth shooting for that breakout? Uh, and do they think they can get away with it? Or will the economic costs, the reputational costs, and perhaps even the military costs simply be too high. So, uh, so my view is always that the, the solution, you know, there's the ideal solution, which is you get this grand deal and that permanently ends nu Iran's nuclear program. I don't think that's realistic in most cases. It's, we've, we've tried it um, and that's not what the regime wants to do from Khamenei himself. And I think the best way we can stop an, an Iranian nuclear weapon is with a really firm, incredible military deterrent. If we give our military the resources it needs to have that posture in the Middle East, uh, give Israel the weapons that it needs to carry out a strike, Iran is going to look at, at the chessboard and say, you know what, today's not the day that we want to go after this nuclear weapon. Maybe tomorrow is, but not today. That, I think, is the, is the best way to ensure Iran doesn't get a nuclear weapon. It's not very satisfying. You don't get this sort of 
grand, you know, Nobel Peace Prize where everyone gets a deal and, and there's no Iranian nuke. But that's a more realistic way of, I think, how the world is actually working, especially with this current Iranian regime leadership. Uh, well, Terry, maybe I could ask you a similar question, but from a technical angle. When we see that a country like North Korea, you know, one of the poorest, most backward countries in the world, if they can get a nuclear weapon, I mean, from a technical standpoint, can't basically any country get a nuclear weapon? Yeah, particularly when they collaborate. Okay, so North Korea, for example, as you said, it's a really poor, I think their GDP is about 18, 20 billion dollars. Uh, but somehow they seem to have a lot of uh, cash. They have a kind of global network. They're, they're kind of super capitalistic in that respect. And a lot of people think that they are trading in plutonium too. So they produce the plutonium that, you know, some of the Pakistani tests uh, seem to be. So there were isotopic signatures there. So one way to do this, yes. One way to do is to think of this as an alternative. I mean, this is a dark, the dark scenario. Uh, these countries, they're poor, but uh, they're organizing, they share, you know, these six technologies, for example, and they make, and they make money out of it too. So I think it's important to kind of think of this, not just as a national effort, which is what the non-proliferation treaty dictates everything is within national frames of responsibility. Iran, for example, has signed the NPT and they open their facilities, but they haven't signed the additional protocol, which basically limits their way to recycle and to do these kind of things. Now, if they get plutonium from North Korea, for example, just a hypothetical thing, why do they need enriched, you know, enrichment or reaching uranium 235 to the levels of, uh, you know, weapons grade? And I agree, I think it was uh, Gabriel that said, you know, if you reach 20%, it's actually easy to go to 90%. And, uh, you know, if you know, Iran says they will limit to 60%, well, you know, it's, I think they're already, there's some evidence that they're up to 83% and they can easily go to weapons grade 90%. But there are two things. Uh, first, the, the from the technical side, uh, if you can, produce your own uranium, enriched uranium, then you can also make plutonium. And the trick with plutonium is that there is an isotope of plutonium that is desirable for weapons to uranium, plutonium-239, but it comes with also another isotope, plutonium-240, which is a contaminant. So you, you don't want to have, they don't, you know, somehow want to have uh, these reactors run in a way that will contaminate. Power reactors, for example, would not be a good machine for producing plutonium-239 without enough what we call formula material of plutonium-240. So some of this is really, is not just having the machinery, it's, it's also requiring deep technical expertise, which is built, this workforce thing, which is built over many years. You know, you need some 20, 30 years of experience in these things. And again, a divide and conquer approach uh, means that North Koreans, for example, they have some of this deep technical expertise surrounding plutonium, including the metallurgy of plutonium. Um, I think the, the worry is that the longer this goes uh, unattended, you know, this sort of parallel to NPT, subterranean, dark uh, workforce and supply chain, the more uh, it will be, there will be the temptation there to make money. And that's going to be, that's going to make it even darker and worse, dangerous, because we see now other states also being interested in participating in this sort of black market for know-how and, and, and uh, you know, supply chain. Uh, we have another um, question from our participants. Uh, what is the Iranian people's perspective on the nuclear program? Do they consider it synonymous with the regime and its uh, malevolence and would abandon it if the regime was gone? Or would a future democratic Iran continue to pursue it? Um, Ellie, what do you think about that? 
Well, we've seen um, the Iranian people share their frustrations again with um, what I refer to in my remarks, which is the belief that the country really can't afford this nuclear program, that the country's resources are being diverted away from the needs of the people. And I want to just stress for a moment um, the poverty that the Iranian people are facing right now. We're seeing reports coming out of Iran of people selling their own organs because they are so poverty stricken. We are hearing about parents who are marrying off their little girls because so they're so desperate and, and poor and hungry. So in a country that is so oil rich and yet the people are so hungry and poor, um, the people are just incredibly frustrated with the regime, again, diverting the country's resources. And so there's um, three different routes of diversion that's taking place. One is again, the, the leadership, the regime, the mullahs and the cronies have been pocketing the country's uh, billions of dollars for many years, and this was documented as well by the Trump administration when Secretary Pompeo um, revealed uh, details of, of something almost like a, a hedge fund where uh, regime cronies had pocketed billions of dollars of the country's resources. The second um, diversion of the country's resources away from the people, again, is the terror proxy activity. But then the third is the nuclear program. And, uh, you know, the country does not need nuclear energy, right? This is a country that's an oil and energy exporting country. So, um, so clearly the nuclear program is part of the the mullahs, um, you know, messianic fantasies of, of, of attaining hegemony across Middle East, North Africa. And so the Iranian people really have no interest in these hegemonic ambitions. And, uh, and so I would argue that in a future free and democratic Iran, I, I hardly imagine that, um, that the Iranian people will continue this project. Um, I also just wanted to add one comment to um, what Gabe just said previously about the U.S. Um, potentially um, strengthening not only our own military capabilities as a deterrent to the Islamic Republic, but also um, strengthening Israeli capabilities. And um, we are seeing a lot of um, Jewish and Israeli voices asking that the Biden administration um, fulfill a lot of requests that have come out of Israel. But I want to also point out in my conversations uh, with um, Israeli military leaders, uh, you know, open conversations that have taken place um, in events like this, what they have shared is that their expectation all along in Israel was that the United States as the leader of the free world would always be the first line of defense against the Islamic Republic. The Israelis always expected that they would have to protect around their own borders, right? So again, that's Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, now the Iranian presence in Syria, some of their missile activity in Yemen, which can reach Israel, some of the missile activity in Iraq, which can reach Israel. The Israelis were always, um, you know, understanding that they had to protect their own borders, but they always saw America as the force that would be pushing back against the Iranian uh, nuclear program. And so I think it has become quite a shock to them, I think, to understand perhaps uh, under this administration that they cannot rely on the United States for that. Yeah, well, I completely agree from my perspective. Yeah, um, when we look at what's going on in the Middle East today, the lack of trust in the United States or the, the idea that the United States would not be the guarantor of peace and stability is a growing problem, uh, I think, for, for US diplomats. And when you couple that with the willingness of China to now step in and assume a leadership role in the Middle East, which is unprecedented, uh, that really creates future issues, not only for the United States, but for uh, Israel and uh, US coalition partners and allies. It's a, it's a fascinating development that I don't think many people saw coming. Maybe that'd be a future webinar. Uh, we do. We have one more uh, question from uh, the participants. Um, Turkey recently celebrated the inauguration of its nuclear facility in Akuyu. Uh, how, if at all, is that related to Iran's aspirations? I'll just throw that one out. Whoever might know about that. 
Uh, well, the simple answer is it's not related to Iran's uh, nuclear ambitions. Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, there maybe there's some clandestine stuff happening that's not reported in public. Uh, but generally, Turkey is, still has this sort of tense relationship with Iran. Um, they don't like it when Iranian assassins and operatives keep trying to come into Turkey and, and kidnap Iranians. Um, Iran certainly does have cooperation with, in the past with North Korea to some extent, um, with Russia uh, in a more sort of public fashion. Um, but to date, we haven't seen anything with Turkey. Um, and again, um, Turkey is also under NATO's uh, nuclear umbrella already. So there's a little bit less concern about what Turkey does with, it, with, with a, any sort of civilian nuclear program, uh, just because it's sort of, it's, it's already a known entity. It's under NATO's protective, uh, again, it's a protective umbrella. It doesn't really need nuclear weapons. Good point. Uh, yeah, so Turkey hasn't aspired to it. Again, and, and I think all of our panelists have stressed this point, it's not just the technical capability, it is the, the aspiration that's the problem. I mean, technically, if you want a nuclear weapon, you can probably get it. It's how much do you want it, or do you want it at all? Uh, one more, okay, I think we have time for one more question from our audience. Um, Iran has global ambitions. Their proxies have been active in Latin America, not just in the Middle East. Shouldn't any Iran deal, if there were to be such a thing, deal with their proxies as well as their own nuclear program? Um, Gabe, you want to take a shot at that? Maybe sure. Ellie so, has so, uh, ideas too. And, and Ellie can certainly elaborate on, on the presence in Latin America. And when I was with working for Secretary Pompeo, we unveiled what was called the 12 points for Iran, which was our negotiating position of what we wanted to see in, in Iran deal. And one of those points was that Iran needed to suspend its support for its terror proxies, which include Hezbollah uh, and Hamas, which are both very active. Or Hezbollah in particular is, is pretty active in Latin America. Um, they do a lot of drug smuggling. They work to equip um, Spark and other, other sort of terrorist groups in Latin America. And what we've seen is that um, Iran from 2012 to 2018 spent $16 billion um, funneling money to terrorism. Um, it was the largest terror financer in the world, and it still is today the largest terror financer in the world. So even if you, you know, if you have this nuclear deal, that takes one element of Iran's nuclear uh, destabilizing, destabilizing behavior off, off, the prop, off the map, but its support for terrorism across the world is still incredible incredibly dangerous. They've uh, launched terror attacks in over 40 countries, over five continents. Um, they've assassinated um, over 900 individuals in their 44 year history. Um, this is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. Um, and so it really requires action from all countries to address Iran's terror programs. And, and yes, in Latin America as well, because that's sort of a new, uh, if not super public front for them. Uh, Ellie, Jim, you want to add? Yeah, go ahead, Ellie. Sure, I'll add to that. Um, so the, the audience uh, question, I think, is a very timely one because we saw Iranian President Raisi uh, just took a five-day tour to Latin America, and he visited favored countries like Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. Um, and so, uh, and they have since declared victory from this tour uh, in America's doorstep. So certainly I think it is um, rather misguided to try to make any kind of deal with the Islamic Republic without, um, without confronting its uh, proxy and missile development activity. Um, and this is a frustration, you know, so, so first of all, let's establish that for U.S. national security, it is an important conversation that we should be, happen we should be having. Um, but also it is a frustration that our allies in the Middle East, so whether it's the Saudis, the Emiratis, Bahrainis, um, and Israelis that have shared this uh, frustration for some time because they have been the victims of these uh, missile and proxy activity that they have also for years um, asked that these issues be addressed in any deals with the Islamic Republic. Fantastic. Well, it looks like our time is about up. Uh, so I wanna thank our panelists, uh, Lefteri Tsikalas, uh, Gabriel Naranja, Ellie Kohanim for joining us in this webinar. 
Thanks to Zach Goldsmith at the Kroc Institute for setting this up, and thank you to our viewers and listeners for stopping by. Uh, this has been Iran Today between domestic unrest and the race for the bomb. Join us next time for another topic exploring the world of tech diplomacy. For the Institute of World Politics, I'm Jim Robbins, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.